For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, dear friends. On this fourth Sunday of Lent and Daylight Savings Time Sunday. Yes. (laughs) So this morning, we are four weeks into our Lenten journey, and we encounter, frankly, this kind of bizarre story of God sending snakes to bite the Israelites during the Exodus. And it's paired with this passage from the third chapter of John that includes probably one of the most quoted Bible verses out there, John 3.16. You might have even seen a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Martin Luther himself referred to this verse as the heart of the Bible and the gospel in miniature. It's one of those verses that everyone knows. I saw how many heads nodded. And it can be a microcosm, I think, of our understanding of Christianity, our Christian walk. But in America, this verse has come to be synonymous with the good news that Jesus came into the world to save each of us individually, that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, so that each one of us might be saved. My question is, is that what this passage is really about? I find it odd that a verse that starts, God so loved the world, should be understood as being about individual salvation. The second half of the verse continues, everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Okay, that tracks. So if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, I will have eternal life. What does Jesus really mean here? How does he, or how do we, define belief? As the passage continues, this becomes, I think, more problematic. Professing faith in Jesus leads to eternal life, but not professing faith in him leads to being condemned. I don't know about you, but for me, that poses some real problems. There are a variety of questions, but a few. What about the millions of people who lived before Jesus did? What about all those who have lived since, but because cultures and peoples are separated by geography, have a variety of faith traditions, they they may never have heard about Jesus. What about them? If the understanding is the only thing that matters is a professed faith in that way, that sounds like something pretty troubling about God. God that just a second ago, we are told, loves the world so deeply. So how are we to understand belief in this context? I think one of the things that comes near the end here helps us understand this, is Jesus talks about the light and the darkness. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. You see, in John's Gospel, belief encompasses what we profess and how that faith moves us into action, our deeds. Jesus names that we face a choice regarding how we might act. Will we choose to act in ways that connect us with God, or will we choose darkness? And I guess this passage hit a nerve for me This week especially, because over the past few weeks I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and looking at systemic poverty 
in preparation for the Poor People's Campaign rally last week in Dover. The sheer magnitude of the problem is staggering, with poverty being the fourth leading cause of death in this country, around 800 people a day dying. In Delaware alone, there are over 374,000 people living in poverty. There's so many ways to become impoverished in this country. Getting sick, ending up with medical debt, job loss, ecological disaster, systemic racism. There are so many ways into poverty and so few ways out. And the more time I spend learning about the realities of living in poverty and the, and the variety of systems of oppression in this country that contribute to it, the more it makes me wonder, how can we improve these conditions for millions of our siblings and save countless lives? How do we dismantle these interlocking systems that drive people and keep them in poverty and exploit them with little opportunity for them to escape. And it's Lent. So I've been also asking, how am I complicit in these systems? How are we as Christians more broadly complicit in these systems? And what I've come to understand is how our collective decisions, and especially those made on our behalf, have created these systems over time and that they're rooted in our choices. And one of the ways that that has happened is a shift in the understanding of the gospel and even this passage from a message of collective liberation for all of creation and a commitment to care for each other to a message that's focused on the individual. When our lens changes to focus on our individual needs instead of the communal good, Often oppression is the result. And that shift has been especially prominent in the last few decades, resulting in a widening, a huge widening of the income gap and wealth gap and a radical reduction in the social safety net. Now, my point is not that we are directly responsible, but it's to name this correlation between that narrative and the way that our policy has shifted over the last few decades. Now, I also need to name, again, and I'm going to continue to say this, part of our Christian witness is to boldly proclaim that we are called to care for each other and to care for those who are most vulnerable. We cannot be apathetic. And I don't think we can see the understanding of the gospel from a message of collective love grace and mercy to a message that is about only individual salvation. We can't cede that ground. Right here in this very passage, Jesus calls us towards the light, to act in ways that heal and show forth God's love, and to expose when actions lean towards darkness, both our own actions and those done on our behalf. Belief and the gospel of Jesus Christ is both a profession and they are actions that reflect God's light into this world. We believe in Jesus and we believe that justice will roll down like a raging river through our collective actions. Belief is not passive, it is very active. So at the heart of this passage, I find is something that is both simple and quite profound. God loves us so deeply that God the Son was sent into the world to show us just how much we are loved. God the Son came into this world to guide us towards wholeness and restore our connection to that divine love. God the Son came into this world to move us towards liberation from the darkness through collective care for each other. Now what is also good news here is that, this God, is that God the Son came to show us that not only are we deeply loved by God, but that we are active participants in God's love for creation. Our decisions and our actions are an integral part of creation. That 
is belief. We are continually invited into the light of God, the light that came embodied into the world in the form of Jesus Christ. And we are invited to share in that light, moving the world from a place of oppression, exploitation and darkness to a place of connection, interdependence, love, grace, and indeed mercy. The good news is that yes, Jesus came that we may have eternal life and have it abundantly. But it is because God so loved the world, the whole world, all of creation. So yes, as individuals, we are invited into the light of God. But we should make no mistake, this is about the whole world. So framing this fundamental of understanding of Christ's work in the world as being about saving us as individuals was never the intent of this passage. Because individualism is not the light. Collective liberation is. Collective goodness is. Wholeness for all of creation is. That is the light. That is the good news, that our belief in Jesus Christ moves us to love each other more deeply, to care for each other more generously, bless you, and repair our environment and restore all of it to wholeness. But most of all, to ensure that our siblings in Christ are cared for and experience the joy of the wholeness of collective liberation together. So as Christians, we not only have an opportunity, but I would say we have a call to resist this cultural pull towards individualism and reclaim the power of the gospel as a source of collective goodness leading to wholeness, restoration, and the liberation of all God's beloved kingdom. Because the good news is that Jesus Christ came into the world so that we may know God's love ever more deeply, we may work together to create a more just world for each other. May we forever proclaim that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a reflection of God's love for all of our beloved siblings collectively. And that is what leads to our individual salvation. And may our actions draw us ever closer to the light of God's love, grace, mercy collectively so as individuals we will all know God's love more intimately. Amen.